God called Job the most righteous man on earth. And Satan said, well, I suppose so. You've done nothing but bless him and butter his bread with blessings his whole life. That's why he's serving you. If you weren't doing that, he wouldn't be. In fact, if you take it away from him, he'll curse you to your face. God said, I don't believe that for a minute. And so this battle begins in heaven that Job never finds out about on earth. And so in a matter of moments, his entire bubble bursts. Lost his livestock, lost his livelihood, lost his money, lost his children, lost his own health. Still did not curse God. In fact, the end, last verse of chapter 1 says, in all this, he did not blame God. In chapter 2, his wife said, you're miserable, why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? And he said, shall we accept good from God and not bad? And then in chapter 3 begins 35 chapters that we're sort of sliding through, covering just high points on them, of conversations between his three best friends and him, where his three best friends all misunderstand what has happened, and in somewhat typical Jewish fashion, thought he must have deserved it. Thought he must have earned it through some sin in his life. And that lasts all the way up to chapter 38 when Job begins to question God. And he has a series of questions for God, but God is going to come back and have a series of questions for Job. And the last few chapters of the book then deals with their dialogue. Now, as kids... Our experiences with mommy and daddy are generally straightforward. Parents see to it that good deeds are rewarded and disobedience is punished. And then we move out into the real world and we realize that's not true all the time. <laughs> that's not how life always pans out. God is always good, as we like to say here a lot, and fair, but life is often cruel and unfair and unjust. Bad things sometimes happen to good people. Bad people sometimes get away with crimes. Circumstances are not always just or fair. And Job is the classic example here. The best of men, literally, by God's judgment on earth, suffers the worst of consequences. And I mentioned last week that Job's friends had what I would call a kindergarten theology. It failed to take into account the sovereignty of God. That one day good will be rewarded and evil will be judged, but in the meantime, God tolerates sin and suffering and injustice and allows and sometimes even uses them to accomplish his own divine and best purposes in our life. Just because life gets rough does not mean God is in not in control. In a sense, if you could switch me back up on the top screen, in a sense, God isn't, kindergarten th theology isn't just incorrect, it also is incomplete. Because it says something about God or about us that is not true. Our confidence in God's judgment should never waver. Ever, we should understand wickedness will one day be punished. God will see to that in the end. A kindergarten theology is an inadequate in that it doesn't explain what happens when bad things happen now. A right to life group. Let's say like Thrive, one we support in this congregation. Plans a, a right to life rally on a Saturday in the winter, thinking the weather will be wonderful as it almost always is, and it just pours down. Nobody can come to the event. The next weekend, an LGBTQ plus SWVU whatever plans an event, and the sun shines all day. What's up with that? 
Well, the person with a kindergarten theology is tempted to think that God fell asleep at the controls, or God doesn't care, or God is not able to do anything about it. But God is sovereign. He doesn't make any mistakes. He controls both the good and the evil, and he has a good reason for everything that he does or doesn't do, whether or not he reveals it to us or not. And he never did reveal it to Job. He never did tell Job, you the result of a test, an ultimate game in heaven between me and Satan, and his angels and my angels were watching. A restricted theology always produces a tragedy of faith because, listen to me carefully, if you believe good is always rewarded and evil is always punished, you end up trapped in a defective theology. What happens when life beats you up unfairly? What happens when you do something great for God or try to do something for God and it rains on your party? Now, we can blame the devil, we can blame a fallen world, but isn't God big enough to overcome both satanic strategy and human error? I think so. Of course he is. And it still rained on your parade. Your bubble still burst. And if you hold to a kindergarten theology, you are left with only two choices. Either God failed or you are a failure. Now notice I didn't say you failed because we know we all fail. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. You are a failure. Failure is a different word. It suggests an ultimate conclusion. So if you hold to this kind of kindergarten theology, you don't have a choice. Either God failed or you are a failure. And both ways, faith gets sabotaged. It's a dangerous thing to believe. Some people I know have given up on God. Have you ever heard somebody say, hey, I tried the Christian thing for a while, and for a while it went okay, and then boom, man, it was like the rug got pulled out from under me. As if God were a blessing dispenser, (laughs) a machine. You do the right thing and whoop, out pops a reward. And you do the wrong thing and nothing comes out. Other people wind up condemned. They try their best and they don't get the desired result. So they conclude there's something wrong with them that God can't bless. I've met a lot of people like that. Sometimes that's the result of a faulty childhood, some sort of dysfunction in their family or dysfunction in their personality, but often it's based on the experiences of their life. So a theology that doesn't embrace the absolute sovereignty of God is a restricted theology and it will eventually absolutely lead to a crisis of faith. And Job is the classic case. When Job's life was struck with calamity, his friends concluded he must have sinned. Since Job's losses were so severe, he must have really sinned. And so, God himself affirms Job's innocence. There was another reason God had pointed to Job as an example of a pure and righteous man with sincere faith. Job had been given the incredible honor of defending God's glory in a heavenly showdown without ever having been told. Wow! Job would prove once and for all that God was to be worshipped for no other reason than God is. Job's confidence in his own innocence never wavers, never wavers through 35 chapters of arguing with his friends. He still maintains his innocence. 
He assumes there's got to be another answer, but he's confused. So he begins to ask why, and he is absolutely relentless in asking why. He still thinks he's innocent. He never proclaims that he was guilty, but he does want to know why. And he's relentless in his questions about why. And as we move into chapter 9 tonight, he says in the first and second verse, Indeed, I know that what has happened is true, but how can a mortal be righteous before God? And he continues to express his thoughts back and forth with Bildad. And then he finally says, God is not a mortal like me. So I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. Boy, I've had that experience, haven't you? (laughs) God's not a mortal like me. I can't argue with him or take him to trial. I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good debater. I did it in high school. I was pretty good at it. But that's a debate you ain't ever going to win. If only there were a mediator between us, Job said. Someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me. And I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear. But I cannot do that in my own strength. So I want you to notice here, Job makes two important observations, and they're one we need to recognize in our life as well. And the first is, God is not like us. Job said, God is not a man like me. God is eternal. We're not. We are finite creatures. We have not been here since the beginning. God is perfect. We are not. We are imperfect. The Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Most of us don't have to be told that we're not perfect. We fully recognize it on a regular basis. I was reading through some of the dumb criminal stories recently. You know, sometimes you'll see these in the news, thinking about people not being perfect. In Kansas City, This is a true story. Not long ago, in Kansas City, five guys were placed in a, I believe it was Reader's Digest I read that. Five guys were placed in a police lineup. And each of them were asked to say, so they could try to identify them by hearing their voice, each of them were asked to say, give me all your money or I'll shoot. And when they came to the fifth guy, he said, but that's not what I said. Some people, spiritually speaking, we are all like that guy. And in God's court, we all stand accused and guilty. So the first observation he makes is God is not like us. And the second observation he makes is our sins separate us from a holy God. When Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden, their souls were pure and undefiled. They could have lived there forever in that state as long as they did not sin. In fact, we don't know how long they lived there. In fact, that's one of the answers perhaps to the age of the earth or the the creation of the world is we don't know how long Adam and we know this. We know they were made fully formed. So if Adam and I'm getting off on a tangent on another area, aren't I? but I think I will. We know this. We know they were created as adults fully formed. So if they were created as adults fully formed, doesn't it stand a logical reason that the rest of the earth was created in full form? Thank you. That's correct. So anyway, if if they had not sinned, they could have stayed in that state for a long, long time. We don't know how long they stayed in that state as it was. But when sin entered their lives, the same thing happened to them that has happened to every single person since them, including you and me. Isaiah said, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away 
and will not listen anymore. So this passage that we just read to me is very fascinating because in the middle of his pain and suffering, and he had a lot of it, Job cried out that he needed somebody to lay one hand on God and another hand on him and be a go-between, be a mediator, it reads in the text that we're reading in the New Living Translation, but there are a handful of translations that actually interpret that Hebrew word umpire. Some of you may be reading in a translation that says umpire. It's a good rendering of that word. So when I thought of that, I thought about my old buddy, of Major League umpire Larry McCoy. Some of you will remember Larry. He was a winner member here for many years back in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I spent a lot of time with him because he knew I loved baseball. And we, he would take me around. I, I can't tell you all the baseball stars I've met because of Larry McCoy. I traveled with him some in spring training. He's a very dedicated Christian. I'll never forget I was, one of the things I'll never forget in my life is even on a Wednesday night teaching in a class on McGregor Boulevard, he would, be, he would have just driven back from Miami or West Palm Beach or somewhere on the East Coast or Sarasota or someplace like that, and he'd come walking in the back of Bible study in his umpire uniform. He'd come straight to church from there. He was a very dedicated Christian. So I thought about him when I read this translation of this the other day, because when I'm preparing a lesson, I have about six or eight translations around me. And I thought about him, and I picked up the phone, called him, because I hadn't talked to him in years. And I told him, I said, did you know you're in the Bible? And he said, what do you mean? And I read him this verse when umpire is the translated word, and he said, oh, that's great. And he said, you're going to use that? And I said, yeah. And he said, I can tell you one thing. I got an awful lot of calls wrong, but God never gets one wrong. God never gets one wrong. This is an umpire here. According to a dictionary, the definition of an umpire is a person appointed to settle a dispute that individuals or parties have been unable to resolve through an arbitration. And so Job says, I need an umpire between me and God. I need a mediator between me and God. Too many people today don't realize they need that spiritual mediator. They think they can find God on their own. But if you've ever committed one sinful act or had one sinful thought in your life, you have disqualified yourself from being a mediator with God. Sometimes in a court case, a defendant chooses to be their own attorney. If you've ever watched Law and Order very much, you know that. But it's not, rec it's legal but it's not recommended. In fact, Abraham Lincoln is credited with being the first one at saying, he who represents himself has a fool for a client. And that's true. We can't represent ourselves before God. That's exactly what Job was saying here, what he was recognizing. We all need someone to stand between us and God. And he said, I need a mediator. And he was expressing there the perfect problem every one of us have in our life when we have sinned, and we all have. We need a mediator. Well, guess what? Guess what? First Timothy 2 says, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And two weeks from tonight, when we get to the most important verse in the entire book of Job, you are going to see that mediator that Job saw 3,000 years in advance. Wow. Some people don't think they need that. Some people think, and this worries me about the culture in which we're living right now. Some people think they can serve as their own mediator or that they don't need a mediator between them and God. They can create their own version or view of God. I read an interview not too long ago with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I got to tell you, I had no idea who she was. So I read it on a Christian Post. Sarah M Michelle Geller is her name. And uh, she was asked about God, and she gave the position 
perfectly of a lot of spiritually confused people today. She said, I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe in an idea of God, although it's my own personal ideal. I find all religions interesting, and I've been to every kind of denomination, Catholic, Christian, Jewish, and Buddhist. I've taken bits from everything and customized it into my belief system. I'm telling you, that is a perfect description of the average American today. That's what the average American has done. They have created a cafeteria-style faith, a cafeteria-style religion. You remember the old Morrison's cafeterias or Luby's cafeterias where you'd go, you'd get in line, and I'll take some of this and some of that and some of this and some of that. That's what she just said. I'll take some of this and some of that. I don't want any of that or any of that or any of that, and I'm going to put it together and create my own religious plate. And they think that's all they need. 1 Timothy 2.5 makes it clear there is one God and one mediator. When someone has exclusive rights to something, and that's what the word one means, it's, an, word, it's a word of exclusion. It means nobody else qualifies. Jesus is the exclusive mediator. He claimed to be the only way to God. There's a popular statement that this young lady said that a lot of people believe today in today's culture of plurality and tolerance that says there are many pathways to God. There's the Buddhist pathway, there's the Hindu pathway, there's the Muslim pathway, there's the Christian pathway, and many others, and sometimes you just combine them all into one, but there are many pathways to God. The problem is the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a definitive in all three instances. That's a definitive. And no one can come to the Father except through me. That's either true or it's not true. He's either the mediator that Job saw 3,000 years in advance, or he is not. And you don't have to be a simpleton to accept that. Some of the most brilliant people that have ever lived believe that. I often quote, as you well know, C.S. Lewis, as I've read every word I think he ever wrote. And he was, a, he was an agnostic when he started out as a professor at Oxford University and, and was trying to disprove Christianity, and he wound up proving Christianity to himself, and he wrote what was called the number one book of the 20th century, Mere Christianity, about that search. And, and one of the things that is well known, that I've used it so many times, that's well known that he said in that book was a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he was a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. And he didn't leave that open to us. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the mediator that Job wanted and that the New Testament tells us we got. He gave himself as a ransom, 1 Timothy 2, 6 says. You know what a ransom is? A ransom is a price that is paid to purchase someone's freedom. As far as I can tell, the largest ransom ever paid was paid in 1193 when the English king Richard, also known as Richard the Lionhearted, 
was returning from leading a crusade to the Holy Land, and as he returned through Europe, Leopold V captured him in Austria and demanded a ransom for Richard's release to be 150,000 marks. That's three tons, three tons of silver. It was the most enormous ransom demand ever made, but the people of England loved Richard the Lionhearted so much that they submitted to extra taxation. And many of the nobles in England donated their fortunes for his release. And after many months, the ransom was paid and King Richard returned to England. And that's where we get our term, a king's ransom from the true story paid for Richard. Our king's ransom was paid for by the king of kings. He paid the ransom so that we might be set free. And ultimately, that's the most expensive ransom in the history of mankind. Now notice 1 Timothy 2, 6 again. It says, Jesus gave his life as a ransom for a few. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> for all men, even if they don't accept it. Even if they don't accept that free gift of life. He gave it for all men. So for you, I don't think I've ever told this story, but a few years ago I remember reading a story and I filed it away. And I've not been able to prove by snoops or any of the any of the, um, any of the uh, websites that tell you whether something's true or not, I've not been able to prove its accuracy or not. So since I haven't been able to, let's call it a parable. Let's just call it a parable. And let's call it a parable of donuts and push-ups. I'd rather have a donut than a push-up, wouldn't you? But let's call it donuts and push-ups. Supposedly, in a Christian college, there was a theology professor named Dr. Christensen and every semester, he taught a Bible survey course that all freshmen were required to take. And it was like when, I'm sure Allie went to, I'm sure they did this at ACU, did when I went to Lipscomb, that when you go in your freshman year, you have to take a freshman Bible course. Mine was called the Life of Christ, that you have to take, and it's not optional no matter who the students are. And he said he would always try his best to explain the free gift of salvation, but it seemed so boring to them. The students just always seemed bored, out of touch, not paying attention. So one year, he came up with a different plan. There was a student who played on the football team named Steve. And Steve was a, had a, per, he was a 4.0 student, and he was also very strong. And so he went to Steve one day, and he said, listen, I, I want to tell you what I'd like to do. How many push-ups do you do a day, or can you do a day? And Steve said, I can do 200. I've done 200 a few times in workouts, and he said, okay, so I want to tell you what I'd like to do, and, and you tell me if you're willing to do this. And so he sat down and told Steve the plan, and Steve said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. So the next day, all the students came in the classroom, and when they came in, they saw three big, thick boxes of extra delicious, huge donuts and their mouths began to water as they thought they were about to have a big donut party instead of class. And Dr. Christensen took a box of donuts and went to the girl in the front row and said, Cynthia, would you like a donut? And she said, yes. And so he turned to Steve and he said, Steve, would you get down on the floor and do 10 push-ups so Cynthia can have a donut? And so Steve got down and easily did 10 push-ups and Cynthia got her donut and began to eat. And the class all laughed and thought that was funny. And so... He went to the next student and said, Joe, would you like a donut? And when he nodded, the professor said, Steve, will you hop back down and do 10 more push-ups so Joe can have a donut? And so he dropped down and did another 10 push-ups, and so it continued for everybody who got a donut as he went down the line of every student in the class. Steve had to pop down and do, do, do 10 push-ups. After six or seven students, Steve is <laughs> obviously sweating, Muscles are tensing up. The students are no longer smiling. And so Dr. Christensen came to Mike, who was a member of the basketball team. And Mike said, I can do my own 10 push-ups. And Dr. Christensen said, no, 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 Mike, that's not the way it works. 
Steve has to do the push-ups. And Mike said, well, then I don't want a donut. And he said, well, you don't have to eat the donut. As he popped a donut out, put it right on his chair, right in front of him. You don't have to eat the donut, but Steve has to do the 10 push-ups. Steve, please do 10 push-ups so Mike can have a donut. And when Steve started doing the push-ups, Mike said, hey, I said I don't want a donut. Dr. Christensen turned to the entire class and said, listen up and listen carefully. This is my class. You're sitting in my desk, and this is my plan. If you don't want your donut, just leave it on the desk. I will not force you to eat it. And he continued down the line going to each student, and Steve did 10 push-ups over and over again. And by now, he was sweating profusely, barely able to get through the 10th push-up. At this point, he refused to even get up and go sit in his seat anymore. He just stayed on the floor waiting for the next set. By now, the students were getting mad. Dr. Christensen came to Jenny on the third row, and he said, Jenny, do you want a donut? And she said, no, I do not want a donut, and don't make Steve do any more push-ups. And the professor laid a donut on her desk and said, Steve, do 10 push-ups so Jenny cannot have a donut. And by now, uneaten donuts were over the last dozen or so desks. Finally, he came to an unbeliever named Robert. And when he asked Robert if he wanted a donut, Robert said, you're crazy. And this is a stupid plan. And as Dr. Christensen put a donut on Robert's desk, he said, some people say that. Some people would agree with you. Steve, please do 10 push-ups so that Robert can have the donut that he doesn't want. And soon, the only sound that was heard in the class was Steve's heavy breathing as he struggled to get through the last of 10 push-ups and a few quiet sobs from the girls in the class who were crying as they watched him suffering. He had now done over 25 sets of 10 push-ups. When Dr. Christensen came to the last student, he said, Susan, would you like a donut? And with tears streaming down her face, she said, why can't I help him? Why can't I help him? Why can't I do the push-ups for my own donuts? And by that point, Dr. Christensen was on the verge of tears himself, and he said, no. Steve has to do it alone. I looked in the grade book, and Steve is the only student with a perfect A-plus average. He's the only student who hasn't skipped a class. He's the only student who hasn't missed turning in an assignment. And Steve himself told me that when somebody messes up in football practice, they all have to do push-ups. So Steve and I made a deal. Since all of you have messed up in my class, Steve has agreed to do 10 push-ups for each of you so you can enjoy the donut. And he turned to an obviously exhausted Steve, and he said, Steve, do 10 more push-ups for Susan to have a donut. And as Steve slowly finished the last push-up and accomplished, he realized all that had been required of him and the conversation he had had with the professor the day before. Steve said, it is finished. And Dr. Christensen turned around to the stunned students and said, and so it was that our Savior Jesus Christ gave his all on the cross to pay for our sins and with the understanding that he had done everything he could do he said, it is finished. And like some of the students in this room, many people choose to leave the gift that Jesus gave them on the desk. And as two of the male students went down to help Steve get up from the floor and help 
hold him up. Dr. Christensen turned to him and said, well done, good and faithful servant. Class dismissed. And while some of those students never accepted the free gift of eternal life, none of them ever forgot the message. 4,000 years ago, Job recognized the core problem of the human condition. How can we ever hope to relate to, much less stand before, a righteous God when we are mere men? We've got to have an umpire. We've got to have a mediator who can relate to both God and to man. And so God created the God-man. The one mediator who is the way, the truth, and the life. The umpire that Job needed and eventually got, as we will see later in the book, and the umpire we all need to.